Edwin Canastrachi here. And that's right, I believe the Beatles masterminded Paul is dead. Do I think Paul is really dead or was dead back in 1966? I'll get into that when I get into that. But yes, I definitely believe that the Beatles were at very least behind the hoax. This is a journey that began for me back in 1999. Yeah, the 20th century. 1999. With my good friend, Fred Seaton. Fred Seaton's an old high school buddy of mine and an occasional collaborator. We've written a lot of things together in the past. Books, screenplays, crazy notes on cocktail napkins. And let me tell you something about Fred. He's a truth seeker. He sees conspiracies in a lot of things. And he convinced me of this one. Back in 99, in his parents' basement, we were listening to some old Beatles records, his dad's old Beatles records, and Fred turned to me and he just shook his head and said, people are just scraping the surface. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, with Paul's dead, people are just scraping the surface. They haven't even discovered half the clues that are there. I was intrigued. And he went on. He said, you know how John sings the Wars was Paul? Well, it's a red herring. That really intrigued me. The Wars was Paul was a red herring. I got very into this. I started diving into the clues. Soon we started diving into it together and we rented the DVD of Mystery Tour. We read Gary Patterson's The Walrus Was Paul. We got really obsessed with it. And then Fred and I, we got caught up in other stuff. We just kind of moved on and let it slip away. So much so that I assumed all the cool stuff we discovered, including the centerpiece clue, which to me is the biggest and most shocking Paul's Dead clue. With the internet and Blu-rays and what have you, I just assumed all this stuff would be on YouTube by this point. Fred and me started talking about it again, and I went on YouTube. They were just recycling all the old stuff I'd already known for years. You know, all the basic stuff that's been canonized. You know, your 28 ifs and Paul's a dead man, miss him, miss him, miss him, Paul barefooted on the Abbey Road cover and all that stuff. And none of the really big, shocking, meaty clues that we discovered back in 1999. So I said to Fred, hey, I got this YouTube channel. We should stake our claim. We should tell people the truth. People deserve the truth. And Fred said, yeah, go ahead. Godspeed. Tell people the truth. They need to know. So I am using YouTube now as a truth-bearing vehicle to let you Beatle fans know that the Beatles masterminded Paul's dead, and I aim to prove it with this two-part video series. Paul's Dead Mania began in the fall of 1969, shortly after the release of Abbey Road. That autumn, Detroit DJ Russell Gibb was tipped off by a caller identified only as Tom that the Fab Four were leaving secret messages in their music. Secret messages that suggested their bandmate Paul McCartney was killed years prior and replaced by an imposter. Thus erupted a brief national hysteria and a long-lasting myth among Paul's dead enthusiasts. These Paul's dead clues led truth seekers to outline a rough sketch of what happened to McCartney. In the fall of 1966, Paul McCartney was killed in a car accident after receiving severe head wounds from the crash. The surviving Beatles, concerned they may lose their public without Paul, decided to cover up his death and replace him with a McCartney double named Willem Campbell, supposedly the winner of a Paul McCartney look-alike contest. Death clues and myth aside, it is quite obvious that Paul McCartney wasn't killed in 1966, and the notion that he was replaced by a look-alike a lookalike who'd go on to pen some of the greatest pop and rock music of the late 1960s. Well, at best, it's laughable. At worst, an insult to McCartney's artistic legacy. But just because Paul McCartney wasn't killed and replaced by an imposter in the mid-60s doesn't mean it wasn't a deliberate hoax perpetuated by the Beatles. I, myself, believe the Beatles were placing secret messages and clues in their music. Clues that led fans to a deathly conclusion. However, these fans represent a small fraction of the fan base, and the Paul's Dead myth is often rejected in serious discussion or critical analysis of the Beatles. The fact that the Beatles denied the existence of secret messages in their work further undercuts the myth and assures the faithful that Paul's Dead is nothing but a footnote in the Beatles' story and the result of drugged-out fans imagining messages and clues that weren't really there. To make the lives of Paul's Dead enthusiasts even harder, it has been revealed that many of these clues in the Paul's Dead canon have been proven false. For example, the 28 if clue on the cover of Abbey Road is mathematically inconsistent with Paul's age at the time of the album's release. Paul was 27. 
The Warus is neither a Nordic nor a Greek symbol of death, and the imposter Wilm Campbell was the figment of a journalist's imagination. Fred Labar, a student journalist for the Michigan Daily, inspired by the Russell Gibb radio show, penned a tongue-in-cheek article called McCartney Dead, New Evidence Brought to Light. Published on October 14, 1969, Labar expanded upon the accounts of Paul's demise and embellished where he saw fit. When his article was taken seriously by some fans, Labar was interviewed by the Big Fat magazine. It was during this interview that he admitted to fabricating the wars as being symbolic with death and also pled guilty to inventing the imposter, Wilm Campbell. Today, Paul's dead enthusiasts either ignore or are unaware of Labar's denunciations. Most online articles and videos dealing with Paul's dead recycle the same tired clues regardless of how substantial they may or may not be. However, disregarding Labar's fabrications and a few debunked clues, Paul McCartney is often out of place on album covers and promotional material. There are a large amount of lyrics and imagery that refer to an automobile accident and a certain mirror trick that's too precise to be a mere coincidence and which I'll discuss in my second video. Also, there's a dark and cryptic content Fred and I discovered in the Beatles' Magical Mystery Tour film that aligns perfectly with the established Paul's Dead myth. The fact that the Mystery Tour film, with its highly interpretable imagery and deftly subtext, is rarely mined for clues proves a lack of serious investigation and analysis into the Paul's Dead myth. Because it was released in the United States only after the advent of home video, the film was never included in the canon of Paul's Dead, even though the film contains the most credible clues pointing to a secret narrative. Even R. Gary Patterson, author of The Wars with Paul, barely discussed the film despite his otherwise in-depth research and discovering the earlier mentioned mirror trick. Patterson, along with most Paul's Dead enthusiasts, missed several big clues in the film, including the biggest one of all. This clue, embedded in the Mystery Tour film and only decipherable with modern technology, is so shocking it will forever change how you look at the Beatles. The Magical Mystery Tour film, written, produced, directed, and starring the Beatles, originally aired on BBC One in black and white on Boxing Day, December 26th. 1967. The film was poorly received by critics and audiences, although its accompanying soundtrack was a commercial and critical success. Obviously, the fact that this colorful psychedelic film was originally aired in black and white didn't do it any favors. Plus, being inspired by the surrealistic work of Fellini's Eight and a Half, the film was surely too weird for the BBC crowd. Unfortunately, the audience who'd be most receptive to Mystery Tour's stream of conscious absurdity and bizarre sequences were busy toking up and spinning records. TV wasn't their scene, man. If only Paul's dead enthusiasts had access to the film in 1969, no doubt they would have had a field day with it. From four or five magicians conspiring behind the scenes to numerous references to death, Mystery Tour should be the mecca for anyone seeking Paul's dead clues. And yet, it still goes largely ignored to this day. When Fred and I first watched a DVD copy of Mystery Tour back in 1999, we immediately recognized its darker significance. In the opening sequence of the film, John gives narration over the title track. He says, When a man buys a ticket for a magical mystery tour, he knows what to expect. In other words, whoever buys a ticket for a mystery tour should expect a mystery. Throughout the film, an accompanying storybook, narrator John speaks directly to the viewers and readers. He periodically makes sure that everyone is having a lovely time and talks up the tour's magical nature. However, what John is more tight-lipped about is the mystery. What exactly is the mystery in Magical Mystery Tour? Most fans and critics dismiss this word choice as a flight of psychedelic fancy, but there are signposts that point to the Beatles being involved in some kind of mystery. Found in the Mystery Tour LP's inner sleeve is a strange subscript written beneath the track listing of I Am The Wars. No, you're not, said little Nicola. A few months after Mystery Tour's release, John Lennon would declare on his song Glass Onion, here's another clue for you all, the Wars was Paul. It would appear that with Glass Onion, Lennon was adopting the narrative from the Mystery Tour film and storybook, giving listeners a clue to the mystery in the Beatles' prior project. The lyric pertaining to the identity of the Wars is a clear progression from the Little Nicola subscript. In later Lennon songs, Come Together and God, 
The walrus and his true identity is once again in play. But more importantly, John is continuing forth with a specific concept, suggesting that the walrus is not a throwaway reference, but instead a central character in a larger story arc. In the same manner, Glass Onion expands on the ambiguous plot of Mystery Tour, planning it firmly into another Beatles project, The White Album. By lyrically referencing the song Strawberry Fields Forever, I Am The Wars, and The Fool on the Hill, this mysterious narrative is granted an even larger scope. Musically, Glass Onion also offers up audible allusions to these adjoining lyrical allusions. By complementing the song references with motifs and instrumentation befitting the original recordings, emphasis is placed upon them. It must then be reasoned that these songs possess a greater significance than previously thought. If John was merely throwing out nonsense in protest to fans and critics overanalyzing his lyrics, why is he seemingly encouraging them to do so by repeatedly questioning the Wars' identity and alluding to a mystery and clues? The Wars being a central character in this mystery, it's not surprising the song I Am The Wars is the centerpiece of both the film and the LP originally a double EP in the UK. Literally at the center of the LP's and company storybook is a gatefold photo taken from the film's I Am The Wars performance. Although containing more obvious clues than the Abbey Road cover, this photo isn't cited nearly enough in Paul's Dead discussions. As on the Abbey Road cover, Paul's the only Beatle not wearing shoes. In itself an oddity. But in this I Am The Wars still, we also see his shoes. They're a few inches away from him on the ground. Blowing up the image, the shoes appear to be covered in a red, blood-like substance. If one also looks at Paul's Rickenbacker bass throughout this performance, and also the Hello Goodbye promotional video, you'll notice red streaks on the instrument, psychedelic flourishes, or a darker implication. I lean towards the darker implication, especially when considering the state of Paul's shoes in the gatefold photo and other macabre clues connected to Paul throughout the film and storybook. Also, you can see that John is clearly the Wars, at least in this performance of I Am The Wars. You see John at the piano, and then you see the Wars at the piano. And you see Paul is the hippo. He's the hippo, at least for this performance. Let's look at this still of Paul in the hippo outfit playing bass. Yes, that bloody bass. Oh, what do you know? It looks like Hippo Paul is likewise covered in blood. Yes, you see those little red specks all over it, the white furry part? And yes, he is the only animal that seems to be in a bloody condition. Also, look at the album cover, Magical Mystery Tour. What do you know? The hippo is the only one that appears to have a gaping hole right in its chest. Once again, this keeps with the established Paul is dead pattern, where Paul is singled out and a little different from the others via this gaping hole in his chest. Now think about the gaping hole in his chest on the album cover and him being covered in blood during the I Am The Wars performance. Perhaps the most shocking evidence that Paul is bloody is the opening tunnel shot of the I Am The Wars performance. Pausing the video at this shot, you can clearly see Paul is standing in what could only be described as a pool of blood. So we have Paul without his shoes. Shoes covered in blood. Paul standing in blood. And he's playing a bass with red streaks that evoke blood smeared across the instrument. We're even directed to Paul's bloody condition in the I Am The Wars performance via the character of Mr. Blood Vessel, one of the more eccentric passengers on the Mystery Tour bus. After a whimsical fantasy sequence involving Mr. Blood Vessel and Ringo's Aunt Jessie, we return to the bus in a discordant tonal shift. Mr. Blood Vessel is no longer declaring love for Aunt Jessie and has assumed the role of tour courier. He addresses the passengers and states that Mr. Blood Vessel is my name. Buster, blood vessel. I am concerned for you to enjoy yourselves within the limits of British decency. You know what I mean, don't you? Well, don't you? The passengers reply in unison, Yes, Mr. Blood Vessel. Yes, Mr. Blood Vessel. This leads straight into the opening shot of the I Am The Wars performance, in which Paul is standing in the pool of blood. Always keeping up with their wordplay, Buster Blood Vessel is clearly a play on Bust a Blood Vessel. 
being that Blood Vessel is the last word spoken right before a shot of Paul standing in a pool of blood, it can be assumed that the Beatles were giving a hint to more discerning viewers. In addition, there's the lyric Stupid Bloody Tuesday in the song. On the surface, a colloquialism, but considering these other bloody clues, perhaps Lennon was being literal. And yet there's more. During the I Am The Wars performance, invisible on the gatefold photo, Ringo's drum skin reads, Love the Three Beatles. Unlike some of the darker and more graphic clues, this has been cited by many Paul's dead enthusiasts, and they're right to do so. Paul is the only Beatle singled out via the blood and lack of footwear, so it's reasonable to assume the missing Beatle in a three Beatles equation would be Paul. And as noted, Paul is often singled out in the Beatles' artwork and promotional material of the late 60s. Only the most obstinate of thinkers wouldn't entertain the idea that the Beatles were intentionally creating a mystery with a deathly implication surrounding Paul. On page 19 of the storybook, underneath an illustration of Eggmen, or perhaps oysters, being led into a tiny tent. In my second video, I'll explain why I think they're oysters and the connection to Lewis Carroll's The Wars and The Carpenter. What's important now is the tent these hapless souls are being led into and what awaits them inside. Next to the illustration is the following text. If we all manage to squeeze into that tiny tent, it will be magic, declares Ringo. I won't tell you the marvelous and amazing things which happen in the tent, but I will tell you it is magic. Despite being coy about it in the storybook, what happens in the tent is shown in the film. The mystery tour passengers are led into the tent and screen the projected film of the Blue Jay Way performance. Interestingly, this is the only major scene from the film that isn't illustrated in the booklet. And it's convenient that it's also the only scene that the story's narrator won't tell the reader about. This is because this marvelous and amazing scene contains the biggest Paul's dead clue, the magical, mystical boy. The entire Blue Jay Way segment and the song itself is grim and deathly. George Harrison sits on the ground surrounded by ghostly mist, a chalk illustration of a keyboard before him. Behind him are interchanging vehicles. Also during the Blue Jay Way performance, a white cello is frequently visible and at one time has its bow sat perpendicular across the body, reminiscent of a Christian tombstone. Almost immediately afterwards, the cello explodes with fireworks and flames. This is interesting because it's consistent with other shots of flames in the segment and at the end of the I Am The Wars performance. Are these the flames that erupted after McCartney's car crash? But now it's time for what I consider to be the biggest and most shocking pause dead clue. The magical mystical boy. The final scene of Blue Jay Way shows three Beatles, John, George, and Ringo, in a private screening room where they are watching a film. George and Ringo have magic lanterns, handheld projectors, which they use to throw their own images on top of the image on the screen. John sways back and forth on a dark and creepy rocking horse. The dominant image on the screen is that of a body without a head. The body's flesh is made up to look like a corpse with blotches of gray and blue. This headless body is lying on what appears to be a slab or stretcher of some kind. Across the chest of the body, extending from right to left shoulder, are the scrawled words, Magical Mystical Boy. Recall the narrator in the storybook informing you what's inside the tent is magic. So like Mr. Blood Vessel is a signpost to Bloody Paul during the I Am The Wars segment, the narrator is pointing you to something that's magical in nature during the Blue Jay Way segment. The Magical Mystical Boy, a composite of cryptic images created by magic lanterns. These signposts make it clear these clues originate from the Beatles and not fans. Furthermore, it shows how meticulous they were in their presentation. But what exactly is the Magical Mystical Boy? And how is it connected to Paul's dead? Some people might think that the body's not headless, but upon closer examination, you see that it is. With their magic lanterns, the two beetles project two different images. George projects a face onto the headless body. That's why initially it looks like the body might have a head, but you can see that the head or face is something that George is projecting onto this image. You could also see that the head is entirely out of proportion to the torso and its color is blood red. Totally inconsistent with the coloration of the rest of the body. Ringo then moves this sharp instrument from left to right across the neck of the body. Immediately after this happens, George stops his projection of the face, and it looks as if the head has been sliced off by Ringo's scissors. So essentially, this is a simulated decapitation. 
There you go, kiddies. A simulated decapitation in the Beatles Magical Mystery Tour. And you wonder why they might deny this stuff. Below the chest of the body, there is another projection. Yet this one is live action. Upon a closer examination, you can see this projection is the Mystery Tour Courier, as well as other seated figures. As Ringo passes over the head with the scissors and chops it off, the seated figures leap to their feet and begin applauding. This is an audience. An audience in a movie the three Beatles are watching. And this miniature audience is viewing the same film. As mentioned before, John is on the rocking horse. It is clearly John. We see the profile and the hat he's worn throughout the Mystery Tour whenever he appears as himself. After Ringo has sliced off the body's head, John stops rocking. The scissors then make a quick pass over the place where the head was, as if to make sure there's nothing left. As soon as it's revealed there is no longer a head, John once again begins rocking methodically, back and forth. John's rocking also coincides with the projected audience members, shuffling away from the film. It's as if John pauses momentarily to not only make sure the ghastly deed was done correctly, but also to see if anyone from the audience objected or was displeased. After the projected audience starts to leave, the body turns black. Interesting side note, the projected face, that is, the face that George is projecting onto the headless corpse, it appears that face belongs to Mal Evans. Beatles fans will know Mal Evans quite well. He was the road manager and personal assistant to the Beatles and appeared in many of their films, including Magical Mystery Tour, playing the fifth magician. That's right, the mysterious fifth magician. Why was he mysterious? Well, for one thing, he stood directly underneath the word mystery written on the chalkboard during the four or five magician segments. Plus, there's the fact that they were referred to as the four or five magicians. I mean, there was five of them. Why didn't they just say five magicians? This is in keeping with the whole tone of the Magical Mystery Tour and the larger narrative which creeps into the Beatles' subsequent work. The Beatles are inserting mystery wherever they can, from questioning who the Warris is is it John? Is it Paul? By questioning whether or not Mal Evans counts as a magician, if he is indeed the fifth magician, or if there are four and he's just an apprentice, and the fact that he's the face projected onto the corpse in itself is another red herring, in the same manner that the walrus was Paul is likely a red herring, considering that Paul is clearly the bloody hippo. It's clear that they were trying to create a mystery, and that the center of that mystery was a dead body. And most of the evidence pointed towards Paul. There's also possibly a backwards message in Blue Jay Way. When the chorus, please don't be long, please don't you be very long, is played backwards, it sounds eerily like Paul is bloody, Paul is very bloody. Just listen. I'm usually skeptical of backwards messages in music because suggestion could easily make us hear things that aren't there. However, this one in particular does sound a lot like Paul's bloody. And with the various other bloody clues during the I Am The Wars performance, it's not unreasonable to think the Beatles, on the forefront of technological innovation in the mid-60s, could likewise be using backwards messages as clues. And unlike the other supposed backwards messages in the Beatles' music, this one could be heard even without reversing it. There's a snippet of the reversed chorus in the background, as the song plays normally. As the Blue Jay Way movie ends, the Mystery Tour passengers stand up and cheer joyfully. The Mystery Tour group is led out of the tent and back onto the bus. After further observation, it can be seen that these subsequent shots of the crowd standing up and cheering, then leaving the tent, were in fact the very same ones used at the end of the prior Blue Jay Way segment. This was the miniature audience at the bottom of the screen the three Beatles were projecting their images onto. They were the audience standing up and cheering the decapitation. Thus, the viewer of the Blue Jay Way performance was all along watching a movie within a movie within a movie. The mystery tour carriers and passengers watching the Blue Jay Way movie. The three Beatles watching a movie within their movie and the projected Mystery Tour carriers and passengers watching the corpse within the Three Beatles movie. This is not dissimilar to Lewis Carroll's Through the Looking Glass, in which there are stories within stories, dreams within dreams. As the Mystery Tour passengers get back on the bus, narrator John is once again heard. 
Well, 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 they are a happy crowd. Immediately after, the bus drives over the tent, in essence, destroying the evidence. Towards the end of the film, there's a drunken sing-along scene on the bus that appears innocent enough at first. However, as with most mystery tour scenes, Paul's Dead casts a dark shadow. The last song played on the accordion, with the passengers humming along, is Jacques Offenbach's Orpheus in the Underworld. A fabled singer and musician in Greek mythology, Orpheus was heralded for his ability to captivate an audience with music and was the subject of many Greek tragedies, most notably the tale of Orpheus' ill-fated rescue of his deceased wife, Eurydice, from the underworld, the source of composers Offenbach's inspiration. After charming the underworld's rulers, Pluto and Parasiphone, with a song composed to convey his sorrow, Orpheus was awarded with his beloved, yet he lost Eurydice a second time, by ignoring their commands to not look back as he left the underworld. Afterwards, he wandered the earth in despair. In time, a group of Thracian manades tore Orpheus to pieces. According to popular myth, after his violent death, the head of Orpheus floated down the Hebrus River, singing a bittersweet melody. By this point, there should be a clear parallel between this myth involving a famous musician who loses his head and Paul's dead. There is additional emphasis to the Orpheus-McCartney connection. Throughout the sing-along segment, there are various shots of Paul in the mystery tour midget, frolicking on a beach. Hence, Paul is visually singled out while he wanders the underworld, wandering around the underworld without the other three Beatles. I don't think it's a coincidence that this segment followed the last segment. Incidentally, the beach is smooth and metallic in appearance. Could this be a cast iron shore? This term would later be used in the song Glass Onion. The playing of Orpheus in the Underworld leads into the Bonzo Dog Doodah Band segment, which contains another Big Paul's Dead clue. This sequence begins with a few men breaking from the mystery tour and seeking entertainment at a strip club. There you go, some more family entertainment for you people. The focus throughout this strip club scene is John and George, who are sitting up at a front row table, and John is especially enjoying the show. The stripper is accompanied by a greasy lounge band, which is fronted by a blonde man whose vocal style is a dead ringer for Elvis. This is the Bonzo Dog Doodah Band, who McCartney asked to take part in the film. The song they perform is not your typical burlesque number. Instead, it's a little ditty about car crashes and death. The title and the chorus of the song is Death Cab for Cutie. The following are the juiciest lyrics of the song. The cab was racing through the night. His eyes in the mirror, keeping Cutie in sight. He saw Cutie and it gave him a thrill. Don't you know, baby, cars can kill. Cutie, don't you play with fate. Slip and slide and down Highway 31. The traffic lights changed from green to red. The driver saw her. They both wound up dead. These lyrics offer an eerie connection to Paul's dead. Once again, there's the repeated inference that McCartney, a.k.a. the cute one, was killed in a car accident, brought about by him ogling a lovely young girl. Traffic lights changed from green to red, mirroring he didn't notice that the lights had changed. Perhaps what's most disturbing about this entire sequence is the cutaways during the Death Cab for Cutie course. You see three guys in white suits wearing creepy plastic masks. Yeah, creepy plastic masks. And they're the ones singing, Death Cab for Cutie. Death cab for cutie. The entire sequence is provocative and slyly sinister in nature. It's as if David Lynch traveled back in time and directed the scene. The song Death Cab for Cutie is officially credited to Vivian Stanchel and Neil Innes of the Bonzo Dog Doodah Band, and it's featured on their album Gorilla, also released in 1967, like Sgt. Pepper and Mystery Tour. Interestingly enough, it's the only song on the album that's written in a rock and roll style. The rest of the album is music hall or cabaret in nature. Obviously, Lennon and McCartney knew how to write in the 1950s rock and roll style of Death Cab for Cutie. And the similarities between other lyrics written by them during this time period definitely causes me to wonder if they didn't secretly write the song and simply gave Stanchel and Inus the credit. 
Regardless, the Beatles selected this particular song and chose to give it prominence by placing it in what's essentially the climax of the Magical Mystery Tour film. The following Your Mother Should Know performance acting as more of an encore than a bona fide sequence. And wouldn't you know it, during that performance, Paul is sticking out from the other Beatles once again. He's the only Beatle sporting a black carnation. Nice one, guys. The Your Mother Should Know performance leads into the end credits, and narrator John is heard one last time. And that was the Magical Mystery Tour. I told you. Goodbye. What did narrator John tell the audience at the beginning of the film? He told them when one buys a ticket to a mystery tour, he knows what to expect. The ticket buyer should expect a mystery. So when John says, I told you, he could very well be confirming that this film was indeed a mystery. Still to this day, many critics and fans are baffled by the Magical Mystery Tour film and write it off as drug-induced nonsense. This is largely because they failed to view it for the mystery and death trip it truly is. It's my hope that people will acknowledge this secret narrative the Beatles had consciously weaved into their work. They're already heralded as the greatest rock band of the 20th century who changed culture as we know it. But a deeper look into the Paul's Dead narrative proves we're only scraping the surface of their genius. In my second video, I'll discuss the profound influence the work of Lewis Carroll had on John Lennon and how Through the Looking Glass, a rumor about Paul McCartney's death and LSD contributed to the Beatles masterminding Paul's Dead. I'm also going to reveal the true identity of the Wars. John or Paul?